Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us at the Global Health Forum. Since last September, Kofi started to organize and host the Global Health Forum every month to lead discussions on global health issues. We hope different ideas and topics suggested through the forum will help raise the value of health cooperation and set the norms in the international health community. Today, we are delighted to have His Excellency Ambassador Togolani Edris Mavra of the United Republic of Tanzania to the Republic of Korea to discuss post-COVID-19 changes and challenges in Tanzania's healthcare system. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you so much, and happy new year. Happy new year. <laughs> yes, I'm happy to just appear on the first day after the new year. And I hope uh, <clears throat> you had the best new year festival. You had the opportunity to go outside Seoul, go back to your home, and you managed the traffic back. <laughs> and uh, surprisingly, this new year starts with a very strong uh, uh, cold day, it's minus 18 today. So I hope uh, we're not near cold here. Anyway, mine today is a very simple task uh, to share with you uh, my is insights on the post COVID changes in Tanzania and challenges of a healthcare system after COVID. Uh, you might be aware, I'm not a medical professional, but a person who has been working closely in the area of the public health with the public health uh, ex <clears throat> experts, but on the political side of it. So what I'm going to share is what I've gathered from the experts on the ground who I'm consulted, but also my observations on how the interplay of um, issues surfaced in Tanzania. And I'm sure of interest will be to tell a little bit of a Tanzanian story uh, because um, our story has not been heard, probably. We have heard a lot about what's happening uh, during the COVID pandemic and post-pandemic all over the world. I think the, the certain general trends uh, that uh, in many places, in many countries, the health system were tested, it's common. In many, in many countries, uh, post-COVID, some gains uh, which health system gained before were lost. Uh, that in many countries, pandemic called them unprepared. Even the countries that we thought they have the best health system, uh, they found themselves challenged uh, that uh, the, the system probably were good but not good enough. So. Mine is try to share that story uh, from our side, uh, what happened, roughly what happened, how we responded, because despite the fact that every country responded to COVID, we, we, we felt it differently, we had different choices to, to, before our hands, and uh, we got very mixed results uh, until today. Very few countries uh, maybe Korea is one of them that can say that we did it well. We, we manage it so well. Uh, but in many countries, there's a lot of other uh, lessons. So that's the purpose of what I'm trying to, to do today. So I'll just, in a glance, uh, tell you about Tanzania so that you can imagine the, you can be able to imagine the magnitude uh, of the challenge that we were facing when this COVID came. And then, um, Something, that, something of interest is just before COVID, as 10 years before COVID, Tanzania just impacted into a lot of investment in, in upgrading and putting in place uh, health infrastructures. What we didn't anticipate that COVID will happen. So it was just like a blessing that we did certain things that when COVID came, we had some backup sort of, uh, of systems around that we, it's like we anticipated. So we, we, we're a little bit lucky compared many to, to many other countries. But also in terms of approach, how did we approach it? And as I said, there's a, choices were very limited, yeah, but possibilities were limited. And I like to give an example that uh, to countries like ours, developing countries, 
the choice was between sinking and floating, not swimming. Right? It's, it's not a question of that you choose to sink or swim. Right? It was a, it's either you sink or at least you float. So choices are very limited. Uh, uh, if, even if you wanted vac to roll vaccine the next day, you didn't have the old vaccine you need, even if you wanted. Uh, even if you wanted to admit everybody, provide healthcare, I mean, services to everybody, the facilities were not there. Uh, things like uh, capacity to uh, pro produce oxygen, for instance, were not there uh, to, do that, to that extent to meet with the demand. So, but we had to reinvent something. We had to survive. We had to deal with the situation. And then there's a the post-COVID uh, changes. Now we have a mixed experiences and very mixed results. Some of them are very good, uh, which tells you that uh, not all crises are bad. You know? Some crises come with the a, with a, with a good things unintendedly, uh, but also there's some very uh, bad results, passing experiences. And then um, now how do we walk towards the new norm? Uh, COVID, COVID see, seems to appear that it's already in our past. Now we are living with it. Uh, some countries are now opening doors today. I mean, just recently, some countries are asking, how do we live with COVID? Um, I was glad to, to, to read here that on the 30th, we are going to drop our masks here in Korea and start uh, moving around without masks. But uh, Tanzania did not lock down. We lived with COVID for the past two years, side by side. Uh, we, normal business was go, were going on. We just do some uh, social distancing and, um, and taking care of uh, washing hands and things like that, but we survived. So what are the new norm? The new norm, the new things now, which uh, appears to that we need to live with it. We get with it and then go into conclusion. So in terms of the Tanzania at a glance, uh, that's a country. We, we are bordering uh, eight countries. So it means, and these are, these are soft borders. So it means the interaction between the people in this region in terms of trade, in terms of social interactions is just uh, very much high. So ours is the country of the 62 million people. The median age is 17 years, a so very young population. And nearly half of that population is children under 14 years of age. So you can imagine also the, the population at risk uh, at COVID probably will be lesser compared to maybe in Korea and in, in, in other societies where they have a very aged uh, uh, population. So ours was 17 years. That's the median age. Our land size is nearly 1 million square. So it's a very vast country. So it's not easy to do everything in the between. People are scattered all over. We have uh, around 54 points of entry in that country. Uh, that includes 14 airports. Three of them are international airports. And then we have uh, five seaports. And then our borders are connecting uh, with other neighboring countries. So through transit uh, cargo, through land. Uh, so we have a lot of lorries going to ferrying trucks, ferrying uh, goods and services to the other countries and going on. And the business had to continue because the lifeline of other side of the, of the, of the Tanzania, of, of the country, the neighboring countries, depending our ports and our access to the economy, right? So that's us. And then, um, so as I said, between 20, 2007 and 2017, uh, we embarked on something called 10 year primary health development program on which we try to bring health facilities to the proximity of 400, we say 500, within, everybody should be able to get um, health service within five kilometer radius. That was the purpose. Uh, so we have a dispensary at every, dis every village, uh, health center at every ward, hospital at every district, regional hospital at every region, and the national hospital at, at top. That's how our, our health system is organized, right? And then around 2014, we, we joined the Global Health Security Agenda, GHSA, 2014. And then we start building our capacities on the IHR, uh, core capacities. And then um, we adopted a five-year national action plan for health security. 
So we start strength, strengthening, uh, by then we have the threat of Ebola uh, going around. So we start strengthening, uh, putting our national, upgrading our national lab to the, to the international standards, start putting some uh, mechanism and measures across borders to, to, to ensure surveillance of diseases, having system on place. So we have an electric, electronic integrated disease surveillance response system since 2014, which was, was, function, was functioning. But also we did a lot of rapid expansion and improvement of health facilities, as I said, uh, human resources for health, we had a lot of training of, uh, and also increasing um, employment of new health staff because we, as, as we expanded health system, primary health care, we demanded new doctors and new nurses. And we, by then, uh, the gap, we had uh, one doctor for around 27,000 patients. So we're trying to catch up and same as in the nurses and everything. So we, 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 ex we, we expanded intake admissions in our universities. We added universities, uh, medical schools to be able to catch up with that. Only to not knowing that in the next few years, we are going to land into, into, into pandemic. But of course, we did a lot of uh, uh, child immunization. We, our coverage were around 90 to 96%. But of course, we're working with uh, Gavi, Global Alliance of Vaccines. But the good thing about it, uh, it, made it, it helped us to acquire some sort of, you uh, call it, vas, va, 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 immunization uh, value chain, yeah? the, the chain, the supply chain, yeah? the cold, the cold, uh, what we call it cold storage and things like that. So we procure that a lot because we need to, vac to vaccinate children, only to know that it will come to help us when we are going now to roll out COVID vaccines. Um, we build new hospitals. One of them is uh, Jakaya Kikwete Cardiac Institute with the support of the China. I think this is the state of the art heart institute in the East African region. So we built it. I think it was 100 beds. We built it there and we started building capacity, sending people to train in China, India, and other, and other countries. And then we built a 608 bed hospital called him Loganzilla with the support of the Korea EDCF fund, and actually uh, whose um, human resource, we are working so closely with uh, Kofi. Kofi is training a lot of our people and is helping us a lot there in that hospital. We built another hospital in Dodoma called Benjamin Kappa. We upgraded our national laboratory. It, it is now level three WHO qualified. So all these expansions and the human resources were just going on as just part of our uh, upgrading of our health system, increasing health budget and everything. And then suddenly in 2018, COVID landed, just like that. Poop. So we, re we got the first COVID, uh, COVID case uh, on the March uh, 16, when we had a traveler coming back from Belgium, right, in 2020. And then uh, it started going around. So we detected that one because we already had the lab and you know all that. So like many other countries, we had a lot of panicking. And, and, and to me, if you ask me, I'll say, um, we did not start with death. Uh, if there's something started was fear, panic. There's a lot of information in the news, seeing people dying in Europe, in China, in where. So there's a lot of fear. So everybody, so there's a lot of uh, ideas of how should we go about, people were panicking. What do we do? What should we do? Some went to buy oxygen gas and put them inside, <laughs> inside their own houses, uh, things like that. And then um, another thing was uh, what I think uh, Tedros, WHO Secretary General said, infodemics. Uh, there's a lot of information and verified. And with the tweet, with the... Uh, Internet, so we had a whole, all this kind of information in the country and they're so confusing. So everybody become a doctor and everybody was trying this medicine and that medicine, so it became a little bit of a panic. So to us, the, big, the biggest challenge was how do you first calm the nation, especially when you have a limited capacity of what you can do, right? So government took a multi-track approach, I would say. Uh, we, we had a political track we had a health track, professional track, and then we had non-state actors track. So in terms of the government track, the government, first of all, activated epidemic response team and the emergency operation center jointly with coordination with the government of Zanzibar because um, we, we are United Republic. We have the union government and then we have a government, a government of Zanzibar that 
deal with the internal affairs of Zanzibar. It's like the arrangement that you have here within Jeju and the, the, the government of Korea, where Jeju has some, some uh, autonomy. So we have the same in Zanzibar. So, but health is not a union matter. So we have a Minister of Health in Zanzibar and Minister of Health in the Union. So they have to, we have to work together to have the same plan because it was not easy to secure one side of the Union while the other one can be easily accessed. So if you, assuming if you say you're issuing um, testing at the airport or you're putting a quarantine and then the other side is not, somebody can may decide to land in Zanzibar and get into the mainland or land in mainland and get into Zanzibar. So we had to work together. So that was one. And then uh, we thank so much our leaders. Then we had the President uh, John Pope Magufuli the late and President Hussein Ali Mwini by then in power who decided uh, to took the matter on their hand. And the first thing they did was calming down the nation. That was the most important thing. And this is very important to me because uh, I, I'm a scholar of leadership. And they said, whenever there's a crisis, first people are looking for leadership. People are looking for meaning. Because this was something very new, very disruptive. Nobody had an experience. So you have to be able to tell people, to be able to make people make sense of what is going on. So our two leaders stepped in. They tried their way uh, to do it. First of all, was calming people. That it's okay. It's okay. We're trying our best. It's okay. It's manageable. Uh, and there's a lot of fear about whether should we lock down. We tried a bit. But later we realize it's not working, people are losing jobs. And uh, in our country, around 80% people are working in the agriculture and are working in the informal sector. Uh, and in, in, in those in the informal sector, they are working in hand meal per day. All right, so locking people inside, while you, don't be, you cannot be able to, 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 to feed them, uh, that, that was catastrophe. We, we could we could, you could be brewing a bigger um, crisis in the future. Uh, look, for instance, like a food production. So how would food production going on if people are locked in? So they decided boldly. By then it was really unconventional. And we, we got the bash from all over the world of uh, why are you going this way? But we, we, the choices are limited, as I said. So we, we decided that we should in lockdown, but we try to tell people to take uh, measures, social distancing, uh, using uh, sanitization. And uh, so that was government track. And then uh, we started engaging uh, multilateral institutions, international institutions, international corporations uh, for securing of vaccines, securing of PEPs. Was when we started uh, small things, things like um, masks, we're not produced in Tanzania. We're importing all the masks. So how do you get masks? And then remember, I, I was reading the article just a few days ago here. Uh, one, one, one journalist in Korea was trying to remind people when it all started, uh, that at first, even in Korea, it was not easy to get masks easily. They were given by, by allocation, by portion, by, you know, and you could, you could only find them in a different, I mean, in, in a specific places. So imagine that's Korea with the capacity. So with Tanzania, that was, was even a nightmare. How do you get PPEs? How do you get uh, masks? So we, so we started engaging around, and and then, and then when the health struck, so the government immediately activated, as I said, the epidemic response team and the emergency operation center. Main interventions implemented, including case detection investigation started, contact tracing started, testing started case management, infection prevention and control, risk communication, and the promotion of public health measures to slow down and contain the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And then we also try to issue some total uh, <clears throat> travel uh, advisories, around five advisories were, wish, uh, were issued during the, same, during the time. But something also very important, we, we, we sometimes not taking into uh, consideration is about non-state actor struck. Uh, government capacity is limited. It's not everywhere. So we, we relied a lot also on the non-state actors. People like religious leaders, because in our society, they are very much respected. People listen to them. And sometimes they're very much 
closer to the people than the government. People sometimes tr uh, trust them more than they could trust the, the official communication from the government. So we had to engage them. And uh, we, we got very um, good response in mosques because we couldn't, we couldn't deny people uh, access to mosque and church to go and pray. Because for, first of all, it is part of the spiritual uh, kind of, um, people are going to find a spiritual solace. Eh? And, and they need courage to be able to endure what was going on. But there was also an opportunity to explain to people what's going on. So the religious leaders, they, 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 they accept it. Uh, the call from the government, they start practicing social distancing because that, was, that is the area where infection could be easily spread. So they started practicing social distancing. In every mosque and church you go, there will always be uh, a place to wash and, and sanitize. They will not allow people in without mask. Uh, and then in every uh, sermon, I mean, in every opportunity, they use every opportunity to, to spread the message about the COVID, including encouraging people to go and um, uh, access vaccine and to demystify a lot of, of myth because there's a lot of this myth about how, how vaccine is bad, uh, what to prevent. I mean, we, some people will say like, oh, this COVID is, is, is a scam and all, all that kind of thing. So we needed that and they, they help us a, a good deal to do that. But we also have uh, NGOs, non-government organization. Uh, they, they had the community health workers. So they, they, for them, it was easy for them to train them rapidly and deploy community, community health workers to the, to the streets and to the rural areas to where people are to disseminate information in a way that people will easily, will easily get. So they're very instrumental in, in the fight uh, against COVID, but also many of them also own the health facilities. So we needed their health facilities to be able to, to, to work in complement with the, with the government health facilities, which were already uh, overwhelmed by, by that time. So mixed experiences, right? So it will depend who you're asking of whether, what happened during COVID. Some people will say like, oh, it was a good time. We made a lot of money. We did a lot of transformation. And some people will say, we, 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 it was a time of loss. We lost a lot of people, lost a lot of other things. So at least in our healthcare system, what we have seen, uh, since there was, uh, Tanzania did not lock down. But many other places where we used to send our people, because many of the complicated cases, uh, something to do with the heart, cancer, and such kind of diseases, people used to go to India, South Africa, now, and some in Europe. So now there was no India, there was no South Africa, there was no Europe, because in all these countries, they, it was locked down. So what happened, that is when we, see, we saw the value of investing in, in, in building our health system. Because these institutions that we had, this hospital that we had, became our savior at that time. So there was a 10% increase uh, of open surgery, open heart surgeries taking place in Tanzania. It increased by 10%. There was a 26% increase in, in intervention cardiology uh, from peacemakers, tent. And there was a, a valve replacement. And there was around 35% increase of surgeries taking place in Tanzania that before otherwise they, these people were supposed to go to India and they would have paid three four times the amount that they paid in Tanzania so that was something good we couldn't we couldn't be that capacity quickly if we didn't have pandemic right uh, so in that time we did around 1800 procedures annually which was not a normal number before and uh, for example, the Mloganzilla Hospital, which we built with the Korean money, EDCF, and then with, with the support, working with the support of Kofi, itself started uh, the service of, of bone marrow transplant, took place in, in Mloganzilla in Tanzania for the first time, right? So those are the, some of the good side of it. But our National Public uh, Health Laboratory had to be strengthened. When COVID started, if we are going for a um, COVID test, it will take you at least 48 hours to get your answer, to get your result, because they had a few um, diagnostic equipments, so they couldn't do much. So we had to,
to buy five new machines and then uh, we, 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 we be able now from there to process around 1,000 8, samples per day compared to 360 samples per day before, right? But also, prior to COVID, there were only seven emergency departments in the country, seven EMDs and 19 ICUs only, all over the country prior to COVID. But because of the necessity of COVID, we had to step in rapidly. So today, we have, uh, we have around 101 new EMDs. Some of them are already finished, some of them are on the way, and there are around 28 ICUs, right? And some of them, they're going even up to the council level. Before that, you could only find these facilities in the regional hospital or at the national hospital, okay? In terms of vaccination, once uh, we secured enough vaccines from COVAX and from countries that donated, including Korea. And then we started um, rolling up vaccination. Our president, uh, Her Excellency Samir Sulu Hassan, took political leadership and, and went ahead herself to be vaccinated in public. And thereafter, we see a number of young men and women, old men and women came out for the vaccination. And uh, now we vaccinated around 29.1 million, the figure that I had up to the early December. So now it will be more. That was around 94.7% of the coverage. But of course, mainly single dose. Uh, we, very few have gone to the um, reboost, booster, right? But we managed to roll out. But this came later, I think almost a year later, that's when we, we went to the rollout of vaccine because at first we didn't have them. We couldn't secure them easily. So what are the good news now? Huh? Another good news is uh, in terms of oxygen, right? As I said, prior in the beginning, production of oxygen in the country was very minimal. And at first people, were, people had to buy oxygen um, cylinders and put them at home. Uh, but now we managed to increase the capacity uh, of from 13 plants 2021 to 19 plants in 2022. Right, so before COVID-19, the availability of cylinders were around 4,900, while the requirement were around, was around 22,000. Yeah. But now, the plan is to take these plants from 19 to 54 by December this year, uh, and to be able to have a capacity to produce at least 10,000 cylinders of oxygen per day. So of course, one of the contribution of this is what coffee did to our Loganzilla hospital. So coffee during that time, step in and build an oxygen plant, which has become very uh, helpful to support the hospitals uh, in Dar es Salaam region where demand was very high. But of course, we've been able to train around 4,500 staff on the uh, how to deal with the COVID, uh, seven, seven, 700 of them on the critical care of COVID. And uh, we end up establishing uh, a plant put a plant to, to manufacture masks and PPEs. So now we manufacture uh, masks in Tanzania as well, which were not there before. So people now wear, they become cheaper and easy to wear. And now it's becoming a culture for people to wear a mask and people becoming comfortable. Because at first it was very expensive. One mask will go up to a, a half a dollar sometimes. So it was quite, quite, quite expensive to people. But also um, overall, the doctor says overall number of respiratory diseases went down because now people started putting on masks uh, a lot but also skin disease diseases and waterborne diseases also went down because of habit of sanitization and washing hands that came with the COVID-19 so there's a lot of a behavioral change taking place until today you cannot get into a hospital until you put in a mask and people will wash people start understanding the whole idea of of, 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 of uh, taking a self-care. And then also something very interesting, in our culture, when you admit at the hospital, uh, it's common for every, every person that you know in your family will come and visit you at the hospital. So the hospitals are usually very crowded during visiting hours. So one patient may get 10 people to visit, even more, right? depending on how, how socially connected this person is. So, and, and, and all efforts before of trying to limit the number of patients to, to numbers of visitors to patients has been, have been futile. But during COVID, it was now easy. 
So COVID allow, allowed us and made people understand that you can take care of a person while you can still be afar. You can contribute money, you can give a call, but you don't have to come to the hospital because the number was now limited, which was help also to reduce number of infections going on because a hospital is, a, is, is, an, is an area with a lot of infections. Going to the hospital is not very safe. So people start moving, not going much to the hospital, which was something very good. But also government put some money into research, local research for medicines, for, 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 for treatment and, 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 and medicines. And around, uh, according to our government uh, chemist office, they approved around eight, 17 to 18 uh, traditional sort of medicine to try to, which are, which are trying to mitigate COVID related uh, uh, symptoms with a varying degree of success. But the, on the bad side, we, we lost around 500 health staff, health, health workers because of COVID. And in a situation of our country where I told you the rate was around one, one doctor for around 25,000 patients and one nurse for around 17, 18,000 patients, losing 500 is losing a lot. So, so we lost a, lo a lot. So that's a big loss that, that we recorded. And then um, uh, immunization, especially routine immunization for children went down because now we, in a way, all attention and efforts move to COVID vaccine and, and dealing with COVID. So we recorded a little bit low vaccine. We were 90%, uh, so there, uh, we do, I don't have a, a recent study, but they said indicatively it's going down. And then um, we got around recorded official cases around 42,530. And then we, are, we had around eight and 46 deaths out of COVID-19. So this is, these are the lives we could, we could, we could uh, save, maybe if we had a better healthcare system, uh, better facilities, better capacity to respond. So we, 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 we lost this uh, nearly 1,000 people. It's a lot. So in terms of the, you can imagine the family cost. I'm assuming one is the, and most of these were uh, people with already compromised uh, health conditions, people with the blood pressure, diabetics, the ones who suffered a lot, obesity. And most of these were also aged people. So they bred in as either father or mothers in the families. So there was a lot of us. With the young people, many survived. Because as I said, our median age is 17. So many of our people are young people. So they could just catch the disease and they could survive. The immunity was still stronger to, to, to bear that one. But in terms of the economy, yes, we suffered greatly. Uh, in tourism alone, we lost around 1.5 million jobs. That's just one sector. We didn't go to another sector. So even if we, we did not lock down, but uh, tourism went down because there was no inbound tourists to come from us because other countries were, were, were locked down as well. But in other sectors like agriculture, things continue the same. So we didn't have a food crisis. Many, many countries after the COVID, they suffered food crisis. We didn't need because we, we allowed that. And then the economy shrinked as well uh, from, which was going by 6%. So it went down to around 4%. Now we are recovering, going around 5%. We're still struggling uh, with that one. So that is the routine immunization. You could see uh, 2018 and 2022. So it's just going down. It went down and it's still going down. So with post-COVID, we're expecting to roll out again. So there are some, some children may be missing vaccine during this COVID. And then uh, now we are going towards a new norm, uh, the post-COVID. Now it's a new norm. COVID is there. Uh, in our case, we have, been we have lived with it for the past one year and a half or two, side by side. So what I can say, as, as, as I, I indicated before, we have done a lot of investment in terms of the health, in health infrastructure and the health system. And if anything that COVID helped us is to give us an awareness of how important this investment is. Because in a developing countries like ours, resources are scarce and, and almost everything is a priority. So spending on, on a health system, why there's an education needs, when then there's infrastructure needs, when there's other needs, Sometimes you need to do a lot of convincing to people that we should put money into health, uh, especially things like health system where you cannot physically see. It's easy for the hospital because it is seen, right? But uh, with COVID, now awareness has been, uh, awareness was raised so much in such a way 
there's the political will from the uh, leadership and the, and the political support uh, from the public to invest into health system because people now have gone through uh, the, the, that ordeal. So that, that's the one good thing. Another one is, um, of course, what we have learned, there's no one size fits all approach uh, to COVID. And the challenge probably was at what point you start changing the gear uh, from high to low. When should you take what kind of measure? At what point you reduce? Uh, it's like, when do you say now social distancing is allowed? Uh, I was full, since I came to Korea, I was following uh, the updates, the way you manage it so well. Uh, so you sit down, there's a technical uh, study and then indicated now we can, re now we can reduce social distancing. Now we can allow people to go to social, whatever, uh, whether it's uh, nightclubs and everything and things like that. So it is not easy to compare countries, every country depending on the culture and so many host of factors. That, that's what we have learned. But uh, if anything, in our, in our case, we, we, we learned that uh, our system was very agile, very agile in life. Because, and as I said, since we had limited options, we had to go with the flow, right? And so I said, we have to swim with a shark without being eaten alive. That's what, we, that's what we're trying. And so, so it made our health system very, very agile. And I think that agility will help us dealing with the next pandemic if it will come uh, easily. The third, um, I, I've, already, I've already mentioned how to live with the pandemic, but the fourth, and probably the next pandemic, the lesson all over the world, we see maybe lockdown is not necessarily the best uh, model. Because even, in, even in, can, in those countries where they locked down, when they opened, the, the infection surge. So somehow, in a way, we, we should find a way to, or, or we learn the way of, uh, protecting those who are more vulnerable while allowing others to continue with the life. The economy should continue. Otherwise, we would have a biggest problem. We had elections in 2020, 2019. All these activities could stop. Uh, imagining, um, because the, the first there was the idea of probably we should close the schools. And then the question was fine. When the children are at home, do we have facilities to, to ensure that they do homeschooling via, via, via internet? That was not possible in our country. So let them go to school. Are children at risk? Not so much. The immunity are strong. What is that risk? The risk is when they're going to school, they might bring infection home. Okay. So it's, why can't you uh, put sanitizers at school, social distancing, and trying to educate children to take care of, of, uh, of not spreading infection? That's, 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 that's what we did. But political leadership is very key. Very key. And key because pandemic, as I said before, they bring fear, they bring infodemics. And those probably are the most dangerous than the, the pandemic itself. Right? So you need a very sober leadership to calm people down, but also to give the people meaning and taking decisions swiftly. Yeah and be able to, to stay the cause because there's a lot of pressure at that time. Right? And, 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 and in case of COVID, nobody had an answer. It was just try and error. So you're just trying. You don't even know whether this is the correct one. So it was just try and error. Today you are told this is the right way. Tomorrow you're like, no, by the way, this is not working. Right? At some point we're told wear a mask. And that's like, no, it's not airborne. Mask is not very, very much helping. Uh, sometimes take vaccine, people say like, this is not working. And then international cooperation is very important. That's what we have learned, and that's what we're trying to engage now going forward. Uh, that, um, of course, we couldn't do it alone. Uh, international cooperation came, although late, but it came eventually. And it helped us a lot in terms of mitigating what was, was going on. And going forward, I think this is what we have learned. The more you, you try to, to work together, we, it will make all of us safe. No country is safer if others are not. That's what we have learned. And uh, I was in the Global Health Security Agenda Conference here, and I was happy to learn that uh, Korea committed uh, to, to strengthen support on member countries to, uh, to build um, their, their system into resilience to be able to deal with, with uh, pandemics. So that much is very much welcome, and we're looking forward to work with the government of Korea on that. So to conclude, 
right? I've, uh, I've said a lot of changes right, that we are coping with. Use of mask, washing hands, and sanitation now is the new norm in, in Tanzania, and it's, taking, it's, taking, it's becoming a culture. Vaccination uptake is now increasing. So because now people have accepted, because vaccination in, in Tanzania was mainly for children before. It's just only for children. Now it's uh, for COVID, even the elders are now taking vaccination. So I can imagine the, 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 the next, if, if, we, if, if, we are, if we are to come across the next vaccine in the next pandemic, it might not be difficult than, than it was uh, when we were dealing with COVID, right? Um, but another challenge, they say now that, you know, at a certain point of time, Tanzanians, people believed whenever you have fever is malaria because we're so much to malaria. So people will just go into the pharmacy and buy anti-malaria drugs. So in a way, COVID changed the narration. Now the challenge is people may sometimes now think whenever you have a respiratory uh, disease or a challenge, people think it's COVID. So there's also a little bit of uh, a new trend of people overusing antibiotics. And sometimes people don't want to go to hospital anymore. They are like, okay, wh when did, wh wh what, did, what, what was, I, was I prescribed last time? So people will go and buy the same uh, antibiotics or, f or find the same antibiotics and take them whenever they feel there's a respiratory uh, infection, which is may lead to a problem. And, uh, and there's no statistics so far of microbacterial uh, co-resistance, right? That's, that, that's what they say. So there may be a resistance uh, building on. That may be a, a challenge to come. But the um, importance of uh, strengthening the health system. So now we are continuing with much vigor than before. Uh, because, as I, again, our sixth sense helped them. We invested and then pandemic came. So now we have every reason to continue investing because we don't know when next the pandemic uh, will come. And now, actually recently, we are debating about um, sending a bill to the parliament to allow national health insurance for all. I come to because it what, what the challenge was many people uh, during the COVID era they got infection and and they did not pre prepare. I mean, income economically people could not afford. Uh, so even those who, who who lost their lives because they couldn't afford, if you're not in insurance, you couldn't afford some of the of the services. And also because you got to go probably, probably to the private hospital sometimes where they need cash before anything else, and uh, it was very expensive. So. Now we are, we, are, we are trying to roll out health insurance for all. The bill is on the debate, but the whole idea is to prepare uh, for, for, the, for the next pandemic. So what we can say, the end of the one pandemic is actually the beginning of the other. So we are not done. Uh, something is coming. We don't know when, how, and what. Uh, that's number one. So at least now is that in the mind, we, that we, we, are not, we are no longer in a comfort zone. Uh, chaos is the new order. <laughs> that's, that's a new message. But also, we now welcome sharing experience and international support in preparing for the next pandemic. As I said, uh, we are happy that Korea is happy to collaborate with other countries on the GHSA agenda, and we are more than ready to cooperate, and we are planning to do so. Uh, and last, building resilience health system is the way to go no other way. It should be a continuous uh, project with no end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your presentation. Uh, if you have any question regarding the presentation or about health system in Tanzania, please feel free to ask. And for those of you watching online, please leave your question on the YouTube channel. Oh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for your lecture and your excellency. Uh, I believe today's lecture has played a critical role in expanding our understanding on the health system in uh, Tanzanian context. 
And the, as an acting country representative of the Coffee Tanzania Office, my question is that one of the hot issues in the health system in Tanzania is the universal health uh, coverage bill, as you mentioned. That given that this is about to enact in the first half of this year, uh, it is necessary to point out at the moment. So in terms of enacting this bill, how COVID-19 pandemic has influenced it so far, and I need your recommendation, suggestion, or prioritization and that, uh, on how do we coffee take part in this ambitious roadmap in order to support this bill successfully. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> should I answer that or should I take two more? Uh, you can answer it directly. Thank you, Tobias. It's not fair for you to come all over from that, <laughs> from Tanzania to come <laughs> to come to ask me this year in 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 in, in, in Seoul. No, thank you so much. I would say with a lot of confidence that uh, COVID nineteen has been a catalytic, uh, has a catalytic effect on the on the need to introduce uh, universal uh, health insurance. This idea was contemplated for far too long, right? But uh, and various schemes were, were been introduced. Uh, we have the National Health, Health Insurance Scheme that was already there, uh, which were covered mainly government employees before. And then we had uh, Community uh, Health Insurance, CHW, sorry, CH, uh, I forgot the name, but, but we also tried that one as well. Uh, with uh, varying uh, success. And then we had a private uh, as well assurances. But again, the, the, the bad thing about pandemic taught us is, uh, you know, in a normal circumstance, you can, you can say, you, 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 can, you can gauge how, how, how much vulnerable you are. And we say like, okay, maybe I don't need it much because uh, literally I attend hospital once a year or, or once in every two years, right? So I can manage with my own pocket. But during pandemic, you find the whole house going sick at a go because one gets in you know, all the whole office going, uh, you just need one person infected coming to the office and then the snowball effect, the whole office gets infected, right? So the health bill at the family level, at the company level became overwhelming overwhelmingly high uh, to, to bear so after that we, we the government realized that you know what by the way we need to if we are talking about health for all if you're talking about leaving no one behind this is the time where people now are more conscious about the importance of investing in health this is the time to invest on, on health because we there were some also incidents of people uh, rushing in to subscribe to the health insurance at the last minute where during during pandemic uh, so we said look okay may, le, 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 maybe maybe it it is about time to take um, advantage of these political I mean the interest that has shown uh, to to build uh, on on our on our health insurance but again I already mentioned that we are already investing in infrastructure they are already investing in the system. Right? So we're trying to ensure access, we're trying to ensure quality. But eventually, access, access is about affordability. It's how can these people afford? So insurance is the best way to go. So this is, uh, we say COVID has catalyzed that one. And uh, what can COFI do? One thing we, we need um, a lot is learning from the experience, especially the Korean experience. Uh, I've been here for a one year now and some two months and I'll say the health system here works very well and, and I'm, I'm personally I'm using the national health insurance I'm not using the private ones so I'm using what you're using right and uh, so I, I, I can confirm that is working very well and I think we need a lot of this experience on how to roll out nationally uh, remember I met one professor and say that uh, I said Korea, economically, is capitalist, but when it comes to health, it's a socialist. 
right? So, so you're trying a lot to the much, I, I mean, Korea has done a good deal in making sure that everyone everywhere gets the health services access and quality and be affordable. So we need to learn from your experience and rolling out the, at the national level. I, I, I'm sure it's not easy. And how do we, because there's a lot of debate about the modality and how do we go about it? Right? Who should contribute, who should not? And then uh, maybe in our situation, you have a lot, like half of the population is children, as I told you. And then another few, another 20, 30%, just young people, probably not even unemployed and they're in school. So who, how do you financing it? So, so this is something I think, if you're, if, you are, if you're offering us technical expertise and uh, experience uh, sharing, that would be a very good contribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your answer. And we have a question from the YouTube, and it's from Rebecca Ann. Uh, thank you for your presentation about health care system in Tanzania after the, post, after the COVID-19. Uh, there has been a lot of development in the health sector, but still, I believe there are more demands in the healthcare sector as well. So to deal with it, um, many international NGOs, governments, uh, and local NGOs are now com coming into play in Tanzania, especially for the healthcare, and they are conducting uh, projects sporadically in the country. So, under the Tanzanian National Healthcare Development Strategies, does the Tanzanian government have strategy to, to enhance efficiency and sustainability of all these health projects? Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Ensuring sustainability is not a choice. We have to. It's not a choice. Uh, unfortunately, we have to. And... Uh, it is actually, the, it's, a, it's a good economics. Uh, once you have a, a very secured and a healthy uh, population, then you can talk about growth. You can talk about sustainability of growth, economic growth as well. So that, that, that much, uh, the commitment is there. Uh, the resources may be a challenge. Uh, the pace may not be uh, as, as we wish, but the commitment is there. And now we have a, a woman president, Her Excellency Samia Sulu Hassan. And I think one of the one of the advantage of having a, a woman president is is is, a, is you're getting a leader who has more uh, affinity to society and to issues that are uh, social issues and issues that are affecting people directly. So she 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 has a lot of commitment towards health, and she's putting a lot of resources towards health. So we, 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 we could say at the government level, there's a commitment at the very highest level. As, as, as I told you, she went herself to take a vaccination uh, uh, in front of the public. But under her leadership, the government um, launched something called Health Sector Development Plan 5. It was launched last year. And one of the components that is categorically stated there is the readiness of the government to work with the non-state actors. Because as I told you, even prior to COVID, all right, because of the size of the country and the huge demand, uh, NGOs and faith-based faith -based organization have been providing um, health services to the people of Tanzania for quite so long. And uh, in actually, in partnership with the governments. In 1992, government signed uh, Memorandum of Understanding with the faith-based organizations on which in the places where these are probably churches or mosques are already having an hospital, the government just invests in that hospital instead of building one. So the government will, will add, uh, will, will give them the subsidies to, to employ more, uh, more health workers, will bring in uh, needed medicine and so that they can, so they can open those hospitals to the public. So, so we've been cooperating so well, and in terms of international NGOs, we have a lot of international NGOs in the country providing uh, services. And uh, actually, while I'm here, one of my interests and mission is to have more than Coffee and Africa Foundation, because these are the two NGOs already on the ground. And I think there's another one, I forgot the name, it deals with uh, uh, eyes, op optics, opticians. 
So my interest is to welcome more Korean NGOs to Tanzania. Uh, because you have resources, you have expertise here, and then uh, there are needs there. And so, yes, I think this is the job that Tobias will help me. <laughs> so we are welcoming you, and uh, the, the experience of those who are already on the ground is a good experience. Huh? We, 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 even, in, even in the COVID, we had a non-state actor um, uh, committee task force, which was part and parcel of the national task force. And they were consulted in every aspect. They were participated into it. So they are part and parcel. We are working together with, with the non-state actors because we believe they are critical and very important in providing uh, health care. And then Korean NGOs are very much welcome. My doors are very much open. I'm ready to facilitate you all the way in. Uh, His Excellency Ambassador Mavra, oh, yes. uh, thank you for your extensive and insightful presentations. Uh, I, my name is Jin. I'm the director for Dr. Lee jong -wook School at Kofi. It's a human resource development partner in global health. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is uh, naturally uh, regarding human resources. What do you think is the biggest gap and urgent needs in health sector manpower development to build a resilient health system after COVID? Mm. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you mentioned that you're coming from the human resources, I said like, wow, that, 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 that's, that's what I was expecting. One of the <clears throat> biggest challenges that we're having now is on the human resource for health, right? Because during the COVID and soon after the COVID, uh, what we could easily do is infrastructure, it's easy. You can erect something in one year, in six months, right? What we did is buying diagnostic equipment, about a number of the PCRs, CT scans, MRIs, name it. We've done that a, a lot. But what you cannot produce abruptly is the human resource for health. That's not easy, right? And the and the challenge as well is, even if you want to produce, I think is one of the most expensive uh, in terms because you, 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 your budget may bust uh, just simply like that. So this has been one of the area of the problem and uh, we, we are lacking a lot of the specialized care. Uh -huh. And I know areas uh, like uh, anesthetic, huh? anesthesia, we don't have those. Uh -huh. I don't have enough of those. I can, we can, I can count. I think uh, health anesthesia, I mean, heart anesthesia may be less than five for a country. Uh, so somebody told me, I think eight in the whole hospitals, I think. Yeah, so it, you, you could only have in the, in, the, in the regional hospitals. So we have that one. Uh, anesthesia, I know that's one area we are, we are lacking. Uh, when it comes to uh, scares in terms of the cancer treatments, and then uh, the heart, again, a heart is one of the biggest, now, because now what we are seeing now as, as we are developing as a country is emergence of non, we call non, non, non NCDs, non-communicable diseases. And that's where we have the biggest challenge because we lack uh, people. So we have managed to send some to India, China, and everywhere. So the more uh, opportunity we get here, the better. But also uh, emergency, emergency medicine, and um, ICU, uh, critical care. And that's what we need a lot. Actually, as I stand here, I have like five requests. Uh, it was like, hey, could you find us a place in Korea to come and, and, and learn and train? So this one, knock me any time. Tell me how much you need. <laughs> I can supply you with all that. Web. But um, midwifery is another area. Huh? Our population is growing by 2.8% per year per annum. Uh, that translates around 1 point something million children every year. Huh? There's one district in the in Dar es Salaam, in our in Dar es Salaam city, 
which produced 100 babies per day. So, so you can imagine. So we need to train midwives, as many as we can, especially in rural areas. What we have done in the past 10 years, just before COVID, was trying to uh, entice women to give birth at the healthcare hospitals, right? And we even tried to introduce uh, um, surgery, small surgery at the level of healthcare, health center, so that women could not travel, should not travel very um, far away for, for, for Caesar when they get the complications. But what we need now is midwives. Training midwives is one of the areas. And um, we have been doing a lot in terms of the training, the traditional, who are already there, but we need to, to, to upgrade them. And then, uh, so, so in, in this case, we need, we need in terms of both training, but in terms of also learning the new methodologies, the new ways and curriculum. And how do you do it in Korea? Uh, because techniques are, are changing every day, every now and day. So we, we, need, we, need, we need those. Those are the areas I think we need uh, them now, if not yesterday. Yes. But human resource is one of the big challenges that we have. We have tried a lot in terms of infrastructure, equipments, putting systems, but people. These are, you cannot produce overnight. And also retaining them. Because another challenge is we produce and then you have international NGOs who need a lot of them. Uh, so many of them after first degree, they're going to, or second, or specialization, they're going to the, what do you call this? Um, uh, Masters of Public Health. They're just going to working on the NGO as program managers, program assistants. <laughs> so, so much as our, our, our intake of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, health, I mean of health students has increased, but many are not going to the clinical as well because demand is so huge also on the public health side. So many are also transiting to public health. So we, we, we need this. But mostly, again, apart from these, uh, very probably could be long and costly training, but upskilling at work, that's what we need most, I think. And I think some of them, can, 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 we can do online. Some of them, I, I, I see in some other countries, they're doing uh, some sort of a visit, which I think is very good. So you have uh, experts visiting and walking in the hospital for one month, two months, and then going out, and then you have another one coming in this aspect. I think that's the best way to do on-job training on the ground. We need that a lot. And of course, I forgot, radiologists. Radiologists. Well, we have very few. Radiologists, intervention, radio radiologists, we have very few. Of that uh, we, we bought a machine called Ang angio suite uh, but we don't have people so it's a very expensive machine but people to run it not there so if you give me if you give me those i'll be more grateful thank you thank you your excellency for your answers uh, because of the time constraint now question and answer session is all over once again please give a warm round of applause to his excellency for sharing his ideas And thank you all for joining us today. The next Global Health Forum will be held in February, and we kindly invite your active participation. Now that brings us to the end of today's forum. Once again, thank you all. Happy New Year.